welcome to our final day of Drupal GovCon 2024. My name is Nina. I am a member of the Drupal for Gov nonprofit board here, and I'm going to be telling you a couple of announcements. So, first things first, thank you to all of our sponsors. First sponsor again this year. We appreciate we've had some new sponsors, some returning sponsors, and I'm actually going to point out some of our returning sponsors. For three years in a row, we've had Riva, Evolving Web, Tayoli, Pixel, Drupal Easy, and Angelina. Thank you so much. For over seven years, we've had IQ Solutions, Pantheon, Debug Academy, Civic Action, Z Tech, C Tech, Promet Source, no, Zip Tech, C Tech, Promet Source, and Mobile. But we have a special slide for my 10 year sponsor. Oh my goodness, a decade. It is Aquia Form 1 and Web First. Thank you so much. If you are a part of any of those sponsors, I really appreciate it. Yes. 
very good with that class. And last but not least, um, train, oh, it's not train, planning for Drupal.com 2025 starts today. We have our kickoff meeting, we're kind of doing this early. So, if you want to be a part of us, we highly encourage it. We'll be meeting in the Chris room at 12.40 p.m. Grab your lunch, come sit with us, come be a part of the team, we can use the help, and we love new people. And that is all for me. Now welcome, Jason from Momono. Thank you. Uh, I am not your keynote speaker today, but I am here filling in uh, for one of my coworkers who was originally going to do our keynote introduction, but unfortunately is under the weather. So, um, yes, as she said, my name is Jason. I'm the COO from Obomo, uh, and it's my pleasure to introduce Bree Banesh, who is a seasoned professional in the world of Drupal and web development. Uh, she has several, year, several years of experience in the industry and has Hone a skill set in delivering web-based applications that are not only innovative, but also highly user-friendly. Um, her expertise lies in me building meaningful digital experiences by bringing together design, functionality, and accessibility. Currently, Bree serves as a solution architect at Amazie.io, where she plays a pivotal role in delivering enterprise-grade zero-off solutions through the Lagoon platform built specifically for modern cloud environments. Prior to this, Bree held several key leadership positions, including Vice President of Technology at Taylor Creative. And Bree is not just a developer, she's a strategist, a mentor, and a thought leader in her field. Uh, whether tackling complexities of a Kubernetes-based environments or simplifying cloud-native infrastructure for content management systems, Bree's contributions have consistently pushed the boundaries of what's possible for the Drupal community. So, uh, please welcome me in, uh, well, join me in welcoming Bree Banesh. Thank you, that was really lovely. I didn't tell them to stand for those things, so it's like really nice. I need a second to uh, get my stuff up there. I'm just gonna... Oh, this is difficult. One day we'll figure out a better way to do this, right? It's a cool wallpaper. Thank you. Your support is allowing us all to come together in person as a community, and it's really good to see all of you and to be here with you in person. So, who am I, and why do I have any room to talk about leadership? Uh, my name is Bree Benish. I was forced to do the math for this presentation, and I've been in the industry for 15 years. Um, I've been working with Drupal since Drupal 6. Um, I've been a developer, sometimes the only developer, often the only client-facing developer, having to take on technical project leadership, making recommendations to the PM, to the client. I've been a tech lead, uh, working as the lead developer on a project, a project team with several other developers, where I was leading um, the planning and building of projects. I've been a dev manager, who was responsible for managing a sub-team of developers, right, who may or may not be working on all the same projects. I've been VP of technology, which is very fancy sounding leading a remote team of 30 plus devs who were spread across the world during a global pandemic in chaotic agency environments uh, where everyone with the dev team was on site, which is a unique dynamic, uh, with a portfolio of 100 plus sites. Um, and I'm now a solutions architect at Amazie.io. 
I'm not leading teams uh, currently. I'm on the hosting side, and I help craft cloud hosting solutions to make our clients' lives easier, to make the development workflows smoother, um, to help them leverage the benefits of containerization and Kubernetes, so they have happy deployments and stable, scalable websites. Always good things, um, right? And so I'm not leading a team right now, but that doesn't mean that I lack for opportunities to flex my leadership muscles. This is a really <laughs> important point. Um, Amazeo is a pretty flat organization. Um, it's full of relatively senior people who take a lot of initiative on their own, so I'm definitely not lacking in initiatives that I own. Um, they just don't relate to people management at this time. Um, and I've got to say, it's actually been a little bit nice to take a break. I can focus on different problems, um, stretch my wings in other ways. Uh, I have bandwidth for a lot more thought leadership, for volunteering, and I've been doing some session review, um, helping out here and there with DEI, and I'll likely be diving deeper and helping out with DrupalCon planning now that I have a little bit more bandwidth. So you can see, I've been in several different flavors of leadership, and through those adventures, I have experienced many different leaders. So, so what are we going to talk about today? First off, I want to say that when we're talking about a shifting landscape, this can apply to many things. This can be external factors in the world around us, like a pandemic, uh, like economic uncertainties or changes in the technological landscape. This can also apply to unstable company culture. Um, maybe you work someplace where the policies seem to change with the mood of the person in charge, um, or is otherwise somehow a volatile environment. Um, any time or place where you're taking on leadership, but there's some sort of destabilizing forces outside of your control which impact you and your team, right? So with that said, we're gonna talk about what leadership looks like, cultivating the right mindset and character for leadership, some tips for leading your team in a shifting landscape, and finally, tips for applying your leadership to yourself, and also, who we stay at the end, I'm keenly aware in between you and lunch, and they're gonna have some really practical hands-on tips for how to apply your care to yourself. So what does the leadership look like, guys? In the context of this talk, I'm often gonna be addressing people who are leading teams, but you don't have to be in management to be a leader, right? And conversely, having a title doesn't automatically make you leadership material, right? It's not magic. Leadership qualities don't magically convey the fancy words under your name, right? Leadership can take a lot of shapes and forms. Anyone in any position uh, can be a leader, regardless of your status, right? Being a leader is about stepping up. It's about taking ownership and solving a problem. Some problems are neat and tiny. You can go off on your own and solve them. Those are great. <laughs> Other problems are way messier, right? They require a lot of collaboration, getting by them, listening so that you can craft a robust solution that accounts for multifaceted impacts. It's good to remember that in times of change, while they can be stressful, they also present us with lots of opportunities for leadership, chances to step up, step in, and help out. Leadership qualities can be developed, right? We're not born knowing everything we know now, right? So you can develop them in yourself. You can throw yourself into things that scare or challenge you, like giving a keynote. Um, you can help develop the people that you mentor or that you manage. You give them challenges and opportunities, right? Give them examples that they can follow. And it's important to remember that being a leader is intrinsic, right? It persists regardless of your title. You can lose your job, you can lose your title, but no one can remove from you the quality of being a leader. That's something that lives inside of you, and you carry it with you wherever you are and whatever you're doing. All right, so let's talk about cultivating the right mindset and character. So leadership is not equal to total power and control, or at least it shouldn't be, right? Leadership is a collaboration. I, there are a number of people who told me that it's kind of a cliche, but I love the phrase teamwork makes the dream work. I believe in it completely. Um, without a team, you're gonna go nowhere fast. So you need to value your team. What is the ultimate function of your team? Are you providing a service? Are you building a product? You cannot achieve your mission without your team. So taking care of your team needs to be a priority. A healthy team is a productive, motivated, successful team. You also need to cultivate healthy humility, right? You're likely in your position of leadership because you have something special. And it's also likely that each person on your team is better at something than you are. Your team members, they deserve your respect for their hard work, their contributions, their talents, and their skills. Your job is not to be the star of the show. Your job is to harness the team's strengths and balance out their weaknesses so that you can make it greater than the sum of its parts and keep it healthy and motivated. Now, trust is everything. 
but it's incredibly hard to earn. It's really easily lost. In my experience, trust is not something that you earn once and keep. It's something that you have to keep earning, and you have to keep proving that you're worthy of it. In my experience, you can build it block by block. These days, when so many of us are feeling jaded, there's widespread sentiment that companies today expect a level of loyalty and commitment from their employees which is not returned. And employees are, understandably, mistrustful. I don't blame them for it. We may or may not be able to transform the companies we work for into trustworthy institutions, but we can be pillars of trust for our teams. Knowing that their boss has their back, even if everything else is on fire, can make an enormous difference in the health of your team. So how do you earn and keep trust? It means being trustworthy yourself. It means being authentic. Now, people are going to figure out who you are. Trying to hide it or be something that you're not is just going to damage trust. It's also going to exhaust you. You've got to be honest. It's better to own up than to bullshit. If you don't know something, don't hide it. It's not your job to know everything. It's your job to figure out what you need to know, get that information, and use it to make the right decision. Don't make promises that you can't keep. This is especially important if you're living in an environment of uncertainty. You've got to tell people what you can't do and what you can't control, but you also need to tell them what you will do for them. If you say, I can't promise you a raise, that's outside of my power to grant, but I will go to senior leadership and I will advocate for you. There's an art to honesty. Brutal honesty is usually just an excuse not to be careful in your communication. Honesty should be weaponized, you need to be thoughtful in your honesty. And remember that timing is important. Directly after a high stress event might not be the best time to critique. After a high stress event, our emotions are heightened and it's more difficult to, tra to take critical feedback in stride. You have to focus on the honest positive, like high five, we did it, we made it through. And then leave the, what could we have done better for a later date? Sometime when everyone has had a little bit of time to recover and come back to a more regulated state. You've got to be consistent. When everything around them is uncertain, there needs to be some kind of through line that your team can count on from you. This can show up in more obvious ways, maybe provide structure, routine, daily meetings, weekly deadlines, but it also shows up in how consistent you are personally, how you enforce your policies, your expectations. Inconsistency will weaken your team's trust in you because they just don't know what to expect from you. You gotta hold boundaries and provide accountability. It's easy to fall from the track of being an easygoing and permissive boss. Because you want people to like you, you want to be nice, all right? But this can be a trap. When leaders are too permissive, I'm not saying that we need to do like, you know? But when leaders are too permissive, people can actually feel lost, and that makes them feel less safe, right? Your team needs to know what the expectations are. They need to know that you stand for something, that you're gonna keep the ship in ship shape, and you're gonna hold them accountable to a certain standard. You won't let things go off the rails. You won't let people blow off important things, and you won't stand for people disrespecting each other. So this only works when you're very consistent in your application of boundaries and accountability. And you can't be a jerk, you can't throw it under authority just to solve your own ego, or just to die on a hill of principle just because. Um, your job, remember, is to help the team achieve a standard of work that you all want to achieve together, and to act in alignment with the sort of culture you all value and you want to build, right? Your job is not to be super boss and boss pants. You gotta be an advocate. You have power. Use it for good. Go to bat for your team. This is you investing in them. We're literally investing some of your social and political capital for them. Obviously, you gotta be responsible. You gotta show up. You gotta be there to grab the wheel when it needs grabbing. Your team needs to feel safe knowing that you're at the helm. And you've got to be able to take responsibility and make the hard calls. <clears throat> Excuse me. If you can't take responsibility for when things go poorly, you don't deserve to take responsibility when they do go well. And lastly, I think you've got to be brave. I don't recognize it. I think it takes a lot of courage to do all of these things. Uh, leadership positions have high visibility, they've got increased pressure, and they're often exposed to a lot more uncertainty. Leadership is going to push you and challenge you, it's going to force you to grow. You've got to be brave to put your authentic self out there, to hold your boundaries, to advocate for others. These are challenging things, and they can feel scary. Let's talk about now leading your team. So if the landscape around us is shifting, it's likely that our organizations are going to need to react by making changes. 
All this change can be really stressful, um, and it's easy to make things even more stressful if you handle the processes around change poorly. These changes are going to go over a lot better if you've been gathering input and getting buy-in around them. Including people in the planning and decision-making process creates stronger team commitment. I mean, I feel like some of this is obvious, but I think then again, I've noticed it needs to be said out loud. If people are included and represented in the decision-making process, first of all, they won't feel blindsided by the change. They're already going to know that this change is coming because you talk to them about it before the decision is made. Asking people for their input and including their feedback as appropriate naturally creates more buy-in for those decisions. The goal then becomes something more resembling a group goal where everyone's individually bought in to some degree. Think about the opposite approach, right? If your leadership keeps handing down unilateral decisions that obviously not considered employee feedback or insight, how long does that go down? People are going to feel disenfranchised and like management is totally out of touch. If you're going to gather input, you need to do it genuinely. People respond well to genuine receptivity. You don't have to always act on their input. But if they feel like you're truly considering their feedback and integrating it when appropriate, they will feel respected, represented, and included. And they're going to be more supportive of changes to make. You can't fake this, right? People are going to pick up on it really quickly if you're just making a show of listening without ever truly considering the outside input. <clears throat> you also need to cultivate this as something of a general state, because sometimes feedback's going to catch you off guard. You might be in the middle of a meeting or a social function, and someone's going to throw a curveball at you, right? And if you can handle this with grace in the moment, it's going to tell the rest of your team, it's going to signal to your team that this is a place of safety. Gathering input and getting buy-in is not just about feelings. Um, decisions are going to be stronger when they take into account feedback from multiple angles and different perspectives. So one lesson that I've taken away from the diversity and inclusion initiatives in communities and companies around me, right, is that diverse perspectives contribute to better outcomes. I was having a conversation with a retired military officer, <clears throat> and he was telling me about some of his missions overseas. He was um, fighting insurgents who were attacking the local people, and he was under some incredibly challenging conditions. He was isolated, he was in foreign territory um, with limited soldiers and limited resources. And I was like, how the hell did you succeed under these crazy conditions? And I was um, struck because he didn't credit his own expertise or some brilliance of strategy. Instead, he said, listening to the local people was key to mission success. Now, it would have been pretty easy for him to roll into a completely different attitude. This guy's like a green beret. He's highly decorated. He's extremely experienced. He had a lot of reason to think really highly of himself and his own opinions. Um, and these were just like simple village people, right? They had rudimentary weapons, they didn't have formal military training. But he saw the value in their knowledge of the terrain, their insight into the situation, their connections, and the information they had access to. He built trust with them, he built respect, he listened to people who may not have had credentials on paper, but who obviously had superior knowledge and expertise in areas where he was laughing. All right. It's really rare that you can get everyone to agree on something, right? In some cases, you're going to have people who are really, really skeptical about an approach. <clears throat> One way I've handled this in the past is to ask the person to disagree, but commit. I didn't come up with this. <laughs> I think I got this from Camille Fournier's book on leadership. Uh, but it's worked for me in the right situation. Um, you say something like, this is how we're moving forward. Um, I respect you and agree, and I value your concerns and insights that this could go wrong and this could go wrong, but I'm asking you to commit to this path with the rest of the team to give your best efforts towards success. Now, the key here is that you are acknowledging and respecting their concerns, right? And you are not asking them to abandon their point of view, but you are asking them to, have, um, to chip in and to help the team with good faith effort. <clears throat> also, you generally need to build some trust the person who this work. Um, and the bigger the gap between how much trust you've built and how much you're asking of them, the less likely this will work. Another approach that I've experienced is called consent decision making. Now, this is, I actually got from a company where I work now, on AZIO, and uh, I've pulled this directly from their handbook, which is publicly accessible, and I'll link on the resource slide at the end of this deck. So consent decision making does not mean that everyone agrees 100% on every detail of the plan, right? If that were required, we would never get anywhere uh, at all. Consent decision making is about making a good enough for now, safe enough to try decision. So consent in this case 
means the absence of objections. In this specific case, I'm going stress. <laughs> um, the implicit contract of consent is in the absence of objections to an agreement, I intend to follow through to the best of my ability. I agree to share these objections as I, as I, I agree to share objections as I become aware of them. All right? And what's an objection? An objection is an argument relating to the proposed agreement that reveals either unintended consequences we'd rather avoid or demonstrates worthwhile ways to improve right now. Right? And so what does no not having any objections look like? It looks like saying, despite my best effort, I can see no reason why the proposed agreement would harm our organization. Um, I see no way to significantly improve the proposal on the spot. Um, I don't think the proposed agreement conflicts with an existing agreement, or I think this proposal is good enough for now and safe enough to try, right? The key to this is that you have to be living in a culture where people feel comfortable to raise potential objections at any time, and everybody has to have the possibility to voice those objections against proposals, decisions, and processes. <clears throat> One of the most important things in leadership is knowing when to act. There's a time for feedback and consensus building, and there's a time when someone needs to step up and make a call. Especially when things are changing unexpectedly around you, you can't be wishy-washy. You've got to have the confidence to make a decision in the moment. If you've been doing the regular work of maintaining alignment with your team, then you're going to be better prepared and better, better informed when you are in a situation that calls for a decision without having time for lengthy discussions. But part of knowing when to act is also knowing when not to act. Often our reactions as leaders, people who take ownership, people who want to help fix things, is to jump into action as soon as we're presented with an issue. Being too reactive is just as bad as being slow to act. You're going to give your team whiplash. Your priorities are going to constantly shift. And you're going to squander energy and attention um, on things that might have resolved themselves or might turn out to not be important at all after all. So one of the hardest things is being able to sense when the right move is just to sit on something or to wait. I of course, certainly don't have a magic formula for this. You just kind of learn it the hard way. Um, I do have a tool that helps you prioritize. That's something that you have to do a lot in leadership, right? If you've got a balance between your long-term visions, your big picture goals, and your short-term crises when everything's on fire, right? So here's a classic tool. I think most people in this room probably seen this. It's called the Eisenhower Matrix. Um, it's also called a priority matrix, urgent and important, right? If it's urgent and important, it's on fire. We have to do it right now. If it's not urgent, but it is important, it's part of our long-term vision, and we need to schedule time to work towards that consistently, because otherwise we're going to be fighting fires all the time. Schedule that time in. If it's not urgent and it's not important, or if it's urgent but it's not important, then you're either going to delegate it or just delete it from your list. Oh, setting the tone for your team. So you're setting the tone every day, whether you're conscious of it or not. Your words, your actions, your attitude, your good habits and your bad habits, these are all communicating something to your team. The tone that you set is going to affect the emotional energy of your team, especially in times of a people. You need to be conscious of the tone you're setting and remember that your words and actions all have impact. You've got to lead by example, obviously. You're holding people to certain standards and expectations. You have to follow the rules if you expect other people to follow them too. And you can't ask people to do something that you're not willing to do. Um, <clears throat> actions speak louder than words. You have to model the behavior that you want to see. If it's not okay for your staff, how is it okay for you? You expect your staff to be professional, respectful, timely. Conversely, if it's not okay for you, how is it going to be okay for your staff? If you never take a sick day when you're sick, do you think the people you manage are going to feel safe taking sick leave? Or are they going to feel pressured to show up and then get you all sick? The things that you say and the way you say them will impact your team. Things like sarcasm or jokes, it might get different coming from his peer than his boss. You can't approach somebody in a sensitive situation where you're talking about feedback about their performance and leave with sarcasm. I just don't think that's, it doesn't sound like your approach to me. You have a great power to influence the team's attitude. When things aren't certain, it's really easy to become doubtful or discouraged. Our own morale is leaders to take a hit, right? But we've got to remember that our demeanor and attitude has an energetic impact on our team, right? If you freak out, your team is definitely gonna freak out, right? And you don't have to be fake happy, and 
you definitely don't lie about it. Right? You can be honest about what is uncertain, but you should try to reassure them about what they can trust. Right? And try to stay as solution-oriented as possible. So an example that I lived through, <clears throat> I was a team gathering, heavy fun team gathering, pizza, something like that. We're all sitting around. Um, and the manager, the manager of the team, lost it in the middle of the team gathering. And was crapping all over the company to the team, was venting about how everything was terrible, and how bad the owner was, and how oh, just everything was terrible, right? And you could feel, you could feel the energy in the room just right? You could feel everybody in the team losing confidence, like, like despair set in. Um, if the encounter had ended there, I guarantee you that this team would have just bled out people, right? In the weeks and months to come, why is everybody to stay there? This is a horrible thing to feel. But luckily, something else happened. Someone else, a dev who'd been there for a really long time, actually stepped in and countered the negative energy with real grounded talk, right? Not like, not a lie, everything's okay. But hey, things are hard, but we have a good team, right? There are things that are outside of our control, and we have to keep doing what we can do as a team, right? Look at the changes we've made. Look at how they've made things better, right? Things still aren't perfect, but we're going to keep pushing. But we're not denying that things are challenging, but we're focusing on what we can do, what we can control. Um, so the energy in the room leveled up significantly, right? Spirits lifted. It's not like we were, you know, ice cream Sunday high again, but it leveled out. All the body language changed, and we were socializing again, and everything, everything was okay, we could move forward. It was actually pretty crazy to experience this go down live. This was like a real life roller coaster of emotion that happened. Um, so as a leader, whether or not you're managing people, right, because the person who was managing people brought the team down, and somebody who wasn't even managing people was only stepping to bring people up, right? Your words have a lot of power. They can bring the team down and they can break the team up, or they can bring us all back together. Spoiler alert, that manager that freaked out left or was not that. <laughs> and the deputy said that he became a manager. <laughs> Remember that trust goes both ways, right? We talked about building your team's trust for you. But you also need to make sure that you invest your trust back in your team. You gotta provide opportunities for your team to step up and to grow. You cannot do everything yourself, and trying to do so is gonna deprive your team of opportunities to grow and learn. It's also gonna create a crazy bottleneck. And you're just gonna be part of the stress out, and things are not gonna be done, so it's just a bad idea. But anyway. Um, Remember that change provides opportunity for innovation and growth in your company, right? They're making new challenges that present opportunities for people on your team to step up and try something new. Give them a chance. You also need to give people room to learn from their mistakes. This means giving them room to make mistakes in the first place. This is how we learn. If we don't ever make a mistake, we can't grow. You gotta step away and give people room to grow to your expectations, right? If you're micromanaging, constantly stepping in to do everything or to save everybody, you're hobbling your team. You need to build resilience into your team by letting them make mistakes, letting them learn from their mistakes and learn how to recover. This will grow your people into a greater ability to weather storms, will grow their resilience, their ability to make decisions, and can also help grow their leadership. I also implore you, to take a damn vacation. <laughs> Rest and lead by example. And at the same time, stress test your team. Okay? Two, two for one. Go spend time with yourself, your family, your friends. And then when you come back, see what went right and see what went wrong. If you leave and everything runs smoothly, well, it might actually be kind of an ego hit that you weren't needed. <laughs> right? We as leaders don't feel like we can't leave for everything's gonna fall apart. But the truth is the opposite, right? If things are running so well that you're not needed, it means you've done your job well. It also means that maybe you can focus on other things. Or maybe you can move up the leadership chain and let somebody else come and take over your role and have a new opportunity, right? On the other hand, if something went wrong, if you did it, uh -huh. it gives you a clear signal of what weaknesses are on your team and what you need to address. Remember that honest feedback is a gift. It's really easy, too easy, to live in a vacuum or an echo chamber. People may consciously or unconsciously treat you differently because of your title, right? 
And they might automatically be impressed by you or interested in you. They might agree with you because they assume that you know best or better than them just because of your position, right? They might defer to you because you're higher in the power hierarchy than they are. They might only show you their best behavior. It's easy to see how you can end up living in a bubble if you don't actively work against it. It's pretty likely that there is critical feedback that could be shared, and it's just that no one says you. I'm not trying to be paranoid. Just <laughs> think about it realistically. How likely is it that everyone agrees with you all the time about everything, and nobody has a single idea about how something could or should be done differently? Right? That's just not going to happen. Um, but you can't force people to be honest with you or to give real feedback. Being honest with leadership is scary. It's risky, right? You've got to be aware of incentives to have power and balance. You've got to build trust and safety in order to create an environment in which people will gift you with their honesty. And if someone's being real with you, especially about negative feedback, you need to keep any defensiveness in check. And you need to reframe this for the gift and opportunity that it is. Now, important, this doesn't mean that you need to put up with disrespect. Right? And you have to pursue feedback. It's not just going to come to you when you land in your lap. Right? When, how is it, rarely will it be that someone's going to come up to you, I don't believe, who's never spoken to you before, and be like, hey boss, the decision you just made sucks. <laughs> Though, it's not going to happen. So you need to build relationships and create opportunity for these conversations, water cooler time, one on one, team meetings, that sort of thing. Do not neglect opportunities for positive feedback, right? Money isn't everything. I'm definitely not saying it's okay to underpay your team. But money is not the only reason people stay on the team. Sometimes people stay to choose with great cultures, choose to stay with great culture, um, some place where they feel recognized, where they feel safe and stable, right? Over another place that might pay them a little bit more. Why? Because we want to feel valued, and we want to feel like we're providing value. It's psychologically important to receive positive feedback on your efforts, and I would argue especially so when stress is high and things are uncertain. Being valued and appreciated, being recognized and rewarded makes us feel like the effort was worthwhile. Especially if you're going through something that's really stressful, things are really uncertain around you, and you get to the end and it's like, that's it, right? Don't miss an opportunity. Remember, I have to say, not everybody feels valued with the same mechanisms. We all have different love languages, so make sure to ask your team what actually makes them feel valued. It's usually a mix of things. Yeah, again, just don't miss the opportunity to praise, to recognize efforts, and to celebrate ones. It can have a real impact. All right. The impact of change on leadership is bi-directional, right? Of course, we're going to think about the impact on our team. We want to think about how our people are doing, what it means for our product and our company and our clients, all these things. But we cannot neglect the impact that the added stressors can have on the leaders themselves. We can find ourselves in difficult positions, making really difficult choices. And so I want to talk a bit about how leaders should apply some of their leadership to themselves, and also, at the end, if you stick with me, some care for yourself. Now, I love the idea servant leadership. Um, I think you could probably guess that if someone listening to talk, but this sort of approach is still the same as like leaders eat last. Unfortunately, I don't think starving leaders make great decisions. Right? Leadership can be exhausting. It can take a real toll. You're expending a lot of emotional, mental, maybe even physical energy. Your circle of care at work is now extended beyond yourself to your whole team. You're responsible for for solving bigger, more complex problems. And depending on how chaotic the environment is around you, it's going to really drain you, all right? Self-care is inherently worthwhile. But if that's a hard mentality for you to implement in your life right now, remember that self-care is team care. Making sure that you can bring your best self to your team. Again, it sets an example for your team, right? Clocking out all the time, shaking up your kids, taking off time when you're sick, right? If you don't do these things, First of all, it's going to harm you, potentially, your relationships. Um, second of all, it's going to signal you to your team that they should also do these things. Um, I've talked a lot about the high standards within ourselves that we're aiming for as leaders, but there are going to be some people in this room who are the type that need to hear me say that you've got to leave room for being human, okay? You are not a superhuman. Your DNA has not been warped by some kind of like radioactive leadership spider bite that has transformed you into an entity with superhuman scalability, ability, okay? You are a normal person, just like all the other normal people around you. 
was only expected to do normal level things, right? We're not scaling skyscrapers. So aim for the high standards, but don't beat yourself up constantly if you're not hitting perfection time and time again. Perfect wouldn't be perfect if it was achievable. You can never catch it. You're always going to be pursuing it. It exists as an unreachable ideal that keeps us stretching and growing. So it's a good thing, as long as we don't take it too far, right? No one around you is perfect, so stop beating yourself up over something that doesn't exist. Remember that a healthy boss has a healthy self. A healthy self is well rested, so you can show up sharp. It's emotionally regulated, so you're not yelling or acting out. A healthy sense of self-worth self -worth, means that you're not going to be putting others down for your own ego or being defined by your title. How you think about and treat yourself has a huge impact on how you think about and treat other people. And again, rest is a valid activity and a worthwhile investment in yourself. Whew, okay, pet job for all of us. You're going to make mistakes. Yes, you, you, me, us, we. We're all gonna get things wrong. We're gonna mess up. We're gonna make big mistakes. Um, mistakes from leadership can have much bigger impacts than mistakes from non-leadership. No pressure. Remember, like I said, it's not about being perfect. It's about how you handle it when you screw up. If you're anything like me, you might be really hard on yourself when you mess up, or you might carry around a really big fear of messing up. And when you mess up, you're probably gonna feel some kind of very unenjoyable feeling, right? Um, maybe you're gonna feel it in your chest, maybe in your stomach, maybe somewhere else. Um, in this moment, if you can, I want you to take a second and do the thing that you least want to do, which is feel the sucky feeling. Um, it's important that you feel the sucky feeling. You don't deny it and bottle it up, right? Because bottling it up is just gonna make it worse. It's gonna just keep stuck inside of you. Um, maybe you can name it to yourself. So like, I'm so pissed at myself, right? It's important to feel that first feeling, and then you move on to the next part, which is breathe. The world is not going to end, all right? Take a second and really feel it. You made a mistake. The mistake does not make you. Everything will be okay eventually, right? Everything's temporary. This too shall pass. It's important to experience in your body the reality that you messed up and you're still okay. Okay? You're still alive. You're still a human being with inherent value. It's important to your resilience as a leader and as a person to do both of these steps. Right? We fall down and we learn that no matter how hard we fall or how many times we fall, right? We're still here on planet Earth, breathing, hopefully learning to fall better next time. And that more important than the fall is that we get back up and then what we do once we're back up. So when you mess up, own it. Take responsibility. We don't self-flagellate. Self-flagellation doesn't actually help anyone. Oh, I'm so bad. Oh, I suck so much. But what is that doing for you or anybody else? Right? It doesn't help you. It doesn't help the people that you've impacted with your mistake. Learn from it. Apologize if apology is necessary. You're never too big or too high a leader to apologize. Right? Also, no, no one is actually required to accept your apology, but it is required that you make one. you got to demonstrate that you learned from this, right? What was your mistake? That's self-accountability. What impact did it have? That's empathy and taking responsibility. You can acknowledge your intentions were different than your impact, but you do not let this devolve into defensiveness. Stay on track. What are you going to do differently in the future? How are you going to move forward better? Be careful what you sacrifice. Leadership requires knowing what your values are and knowing what the company's or your immediate boss's values are and keeping an eye on how closely aligned those two value sets are. In times of change, you're going to be asked to make really hard decisions. And if the company or your boss is asking you to make them be some priorities that don't align with your values, your hardship will increase. It's important to realize and be honest with yourself when this divergence is happening. There are many times when we'll all be in this position, and I cannot hardline tell you to never depart from your priorities, right? It's easy to sit up here on a podium and say, hold that hard line. But it's also a huge privilege to be able to do so. Sometimes you need to keep your job just so you can feed your kids or keep your health insurance, right? 
and you can't risk dying on this hill. So maybe we stick things out for a while in service to a greater value that we hold, like supporting family. But you need to keep an eye on this because down this road lies greater and greater levels of self-betrayal that will have personal consequences you can't escape from. Every time you do something, you carry out the instruction, you enforce a decision, or even stand idly by and watch something that goes against what you personally believe in, you're going to slice off a little piece of your soul. Some examples. You're forced to work your team incredibly hard, denied any raises or bonuses, or even a fair market pay for them. Uh, management turns a blind eye to shady, disrespectful, or discriminatory behavior by other employees, or is guilty to this behavior themselves. Maybe the company also supports or tolerates clients who are disrespectful, shady, or discriminatory, and therefore you and your team have to as well. Somewhere down the line, the bill comes due. Right? It might be psychological distress. It might be damage to relationships. It might be burnout. I have a huge opinion that it's less about how much we're working and more about how, hard, how psychologically hard it is to do that work. Right? If you want to do it, you feel like a joy. But if there's something about it that's damaging you, that's a path that leads to burnout. So this might sound dramatic, right? I actually really hope that most of you hear this and you can't relate to it. You're like, what is she talking about, right? Where is she working? Um, but if, even if just one of you is saying to yourself something like, I know things are bad here, but I can make a difference. I can help people. I can make it better. I can protect my team. You need to ask yourself, is this really a system you can fix? To be honest. Are you becoming complicit with the toxicity by remaining? Is it worth the toll that it's taking on your soul? Knowing that you're not living up to the standard of character or work that you hold for yourself, or by working for something or someone that doesn't align with your ideas of right and wrong. Don't let your own ego, thinking that you can change everything, or your optimism, hoping that everything will always be better, blind you to the real human impact of a toxic work environment, and how you might be contributing to it as a leader, even if it's not your intent. And remember that people can only use your leadership potential, your social capital, and your team's trust in you to their own ends. So you need to guard around this and not let your talents be used in service to a system or environment that's perpetuating harm. Many of us will be familiar with saying, be the change you want to see in the world. Like, I feel that one hard. Um, but sometimes the environment is stronger than we are. And that's simply the reality of the situation. And the healthiest thing we can do, and the best example we can set, is by setting a boundary against what you find unacceptable and exiting. Okay, that was kind of heavy. Let's talk more about self-care. Stress is a killer, right? Stress will harm you in so many ways. You have to be living under a rock to miss the constant headlines about stress leading to all kinds of problems, right? Stress is all around us, especially in leadership. You cannot escape from it. It's going to happen always. Right? If you don't find ways to process the stress and move it out of your body, it's not going to get stuck inside of you. And then it's going to come out in other ways. Your behavior or maybe your physical symptoms like headaches or getting sick all the time. It might feel good in the moment to vent. And sometimes we all need to get things off our chest. But studies are showing that venting is actually more harmful than helpful for us. Um, it doesn't actually solve what's bothering us. It keeps us focused on the negative. Um, and some show actually increases anger and anxiety, right? It reinforces neural pathways around stress, anger, and negativity. So it's really making things worse for us, not better. Stress is going to accumulate if we don't address it. Sometimes even if we do address it, if we're under chronic stress, it could be that more stress events are occurring than we have time and resources to deal with. Stress is going to build up and you'll start having a backlog in your body. Built up stress can lead to emotional exhaustion, which is fatigue that comes from caring too much for too long. Does that sound familiar to anybody? Um, it can lead to decreased sense of accomplishment, this unconquerable sense of futility and feeling like nothing you do can make any difference. And it can lead to something called depersonalization, which is just a depletion of empathy, caring, and compassion. Can you imagine even trying to be without the ability to care, without empathy, feeling like everything you do is completely futile? Like, how can could, how could you possibly leave if that's how run down you are? Down this road is burnout, my friends. Burnout can show up emotionally, mentally, and physically. It's really hard to come back from. It's possible, 
It takes a lot of time and a lot of work. So, how do we avoid burnout? Hmm. When our bodies react to stress, our nervous system responds with fight, flight, freeze, or foam, right? You're all familiar. There are chemical changes that actually occur in our body along with these responses. And our bodies need a clear signal that the thing stressing us out is actually gone in order for it to come back to normal. But it's been shown that our body doesn't magically get this message just because the stressor has been removed, right? The stressor can be removed, but the feelings and the experience in your body can still remain. Let me give you an example. You had to run into a stranger who, for no reason, was super rude to you and got out of your face. Like, what the heck, right? You've exited the situation, but you're still really bothered, right? You feel upset, maybe you're angry, maybe you're even scared depending on what happened in the situation. These feelings persist, even though the situation's over and the stranger's gone, right? Your brain knows it's over, but your body has yet to get the message. Or maybe something that's more relatable, you just done some kind of major professional sprints. Um, you can complete a project, not enough time, budget, or resources. You can really that. You get to the end and you feel kind of like this. <laughs> that is not the elation of success. That is not the joy of accomplishment. That's like it's over and I'm still stuck on Mount Doom with very little chance of survival, so let me just lie atop this rock while molten lava flows around me for a few more moments until my inevitable demise, right? Because I don't know the eagles are coming. Sorry. Anyway. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> so how do we signal to our bodies that the stress event is over? We complete the stress cycle. This is so important. So I didn't come up with this myself, obviously. Um, I got this from my therapist who recommended the specific episode of Renee Brown podcast, which focuses on a book called Burnout, The Secret to Unlocking the Stress Cycle. It's by Emily Amelia Nagoski. I'm urging you to listen to this episode. I'm gonna link it on the resource slide, or you can even, you know, read the whole book, but the podcast is in 60 minutes, so, yeah. Um, so there are actual behaviors that signal to your body that you're not safe, okay? Um, I'll tell you what they are in just a second, but first let's talk about when and how to use them. It's helpful to use one of these behaviors as a recovery strategy directly after experiencing a stressor, but it's not always gonna be possible or practical to be like, well, time out and go de-stress, right, in the middle of your day. So while you can apply these in the moment, and you should if you can, it's most helpful to incorporate these regularly in your life and routine. So with that said, let's start. Physical activity. This is the most efficient way to complete the stress cycle. And this means literally any movement in your body. Walking, running, dancing, dance parties at your desk, dancing while you're cleaning your house. You know, you can stand up, you can shake your whole self out, you can jump up and down, you can tense up all of your muscles and then release them, right? It doesn't have to be a workout, it doesn't have to be a big thing, right? So don't let her get in the way of good enough. Dance to one song, walk around the block, jump for five minutes, right? Any movement is going to begin to process out from your body the stress chemicals that were released. And I promise you, I can attest from personal experience, you will feel better. Personal anecdote, I woke up at 4 in the morning on Monday in high stress because I was doing the keynote at GovLine and I couldn't sleep and my brain was doing the anxiety thing. I noticed that I said, Bree, you really need to just listen to your own presentation. And so I went for a run and I tell you that I was transformed. My mindset was totally shifted. Anxiety gone, focus, confidence. It works, it works. And I didn't go for a long run, not a marathon run, right? Just, just a little bit of movement. Dance, chapel row, it's good stuff. <clears throat> Next, breathing. Have you ever noticed that you get intense or stressed and you stop breathing or you hold your breath? Because I, I, um, the simple act of breathing actually just downregulates your nervous system. This is the gentlest way of completing a stress cycle. That's something you can do anytime, anywhere, mostly, right? Um, it's also the simplest and the easiest. You might think, no way that like, just breathing is going to help me, but it's actually really effective. Especially if you can take a really slow breath in and a slower, longer breath out. The exhale being longer is actually key here in telling your body that you're safe. So you take a, a breath in as far as you can until all of your like, and then let it out. And if you just breathe for one minute, two minutes, it's actually really effective. And you might notice at first that your thoughts are all over the place. But if you just focus on your breathing, just simply like 
in and out. Instead of your thoughts, your mind calm, you will eventually come back to a grounded place. It might take a while, I don't know who you are and things like that. Um, <laughs> Uh, I started doing meditation, and uh, I went to a meditation retreat, and it took me days for my brain to slow down. Anyway. Um, there's also something called box breathing, where you breathe in to the count of four, you hold it for four, you let it out for four, and you wait, and you just do that, and it calms your body. So there's some simple tools that you can do anytime, anywhere, that will just calm your nervous system. Next is positive social interaction. We've talked about this a couple of times, but it can be like, Post stress event, celebrate the high fives. Remember, celebrate the wins. Yeah, we did it. Don't neglect that. It can also be something as simple as the barista at the coffee shop saying, hey, I like your shirt, right? This is just something that affirms that we're welcome and safe and liked in the world. Laughter. And I'm not talking like socially acceptable laughter, like hee hee chuckle. I'm talking about like full on, deep, genuine belly laugh when something unexpectedly hilarious happens and you like, Snort laugh your drink out of your face. That's what I'm talking about. Affection is helpful, and I don't mean like a pat on the back. I mean something like a 20 second hug, which sounds really awkward, and maybe feels kind of awkward. It's not really about the literal 20 seconds though. It's about being hugged by someone you trust, somewhere safe, long enough that your whole body relaxes into it. I'm not even sure he's a good person. I think he'd probably be a pet. Crying. Yes, it's okay. It really is. Maybe you want to pick your time and place. It's totally fair. I hate crying in public. I think most people do. Crying is a physical expression of your stress and your emotion, right? It's your body actually trying to get it out of your system. When you let the crying happen until it naturally stops, you're letting the emotion go all the way to its end so it doesn't get trapped inside your body. Don't ruminate while you're doing it. Don't keep going over and over in your head all the things you're upset about. Just focus on the physical experience that's happening in your body. Let it run its course. It'll probably only last a couple minutes. And the release is like real. And finally, creative expression. Right? If you're creative, you already know how good the flow state feels. And through creative expression, you can take whatever's going on inside of you and you can put it outside of you. It's really effective. So whatever creating looks like for you. Maybe it's coding, maybe it's painting, maybe it's writing. Maybe it's music or textile arts, interpretive dance, mining, Australian break dancing, a la Riga. Right? So these are all real practical tools, things you can do, things you should try to build into your everyday life. I don't know if routine in snort laughing out of your face. That just kind of makes it happen. Um, but you should be pursuing every day, building in every day, so that this, even though stresses are building up, you are getting them out, hopefully as quickly as you can. I mean, don't go overboard. It's so important to your mental and physical health, to your close relationships, and to your ability to show up as your best self at work that you figure out how to heal your body from the stresses that's accumulating. Anyway. Thank you. Leadership is really tough. It takes a toll. We need good leaders to keep fighting the good fight. But the only way to stay in the fight is to take care of yourself. So take care of yourselves, take care of your teams. Thank you. And then I'll bring up the resources slide in just a second so you can take a look. But I think I'll provide the slides and all the links are clickable. Here's resources. 